Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll be focusing on that, that story from 1 Samuel chapter 17 about David and Goliath. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for bringing us here to hear your word. We pray, Lord God, that you would use your word so that we might overcome our giants, so that we somehow would find the strength that only you could give and face the fear the things that make us afraid. Lord God, I pray that you would not allow me, your servant, to get in the way of your precious word. Amen. David and Goliath might just be the most famous story in all of the world, even outside of Scripture. It's weaved its way into pop culture. Have you ever heard an announcer at a, maybe a basketball game, if there's two teams going up against each other, one's a a taller team or a bigger team than the other, and, and maybe the announcer will say something like, this is a real David and Goliath kind of game. Or, or maybe you, you've seen how it's even been weaved into to how we describe nature. Uh, there's a, a gigantic beetle. You know what it's called? It's called a Goliath beetle because this story is so well known. And even if, if somebody didn't have any kind of connection to God's word, they probably know the facts of the story. They probably know about the boy David and the five smooth stones in his sling and the great big bad giant Goliath. And so if this story is so well known, why should we spend time today going through it? If you already know what the story is about, if you already know what the, the main point is, why are we going to take some time to talk through it? Because as one pastor put it, there are still giants in the land. If you think about where this story took place and when in history it took place, Israel had been taken out of Egyptian slavery. They no longer had to fight against the Egyptians. They had gone through the, the dangers of the wilderness. They had entered into the promised land and jo Joshua was used to bring down Jericho and drive out the Canaanites. And even after all of that time and driving out all of their enemies, even after they had established a monarchy, even after they were secure in their land, there were still giants in the land of Canaan. And that's the same thing for us. Maybe you've been a Christian for a few years and you're wondering why am I still facing these things? These, why am I still afraid of the same things I was afraid of before? And maybe you've been a Christian your whole life, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, and you're thinking, I should be farther along by now. I shouldn't have all these things that I'm fighting against. Well, that's the reality, that all of us daily stand up against things that, that are taller than us, bigger than us, stronger than us. We, we still have gigantic problems. And so, don't all of us really want to know the answer to this question? How can we begin to slay our giants? How can we begin to overcome the things that are paralyzing us, the things that are, that are, are, are keeping us from, from fulfilling the things that God is calling us to? How can we begin to slay our giants? And to answer that question, we're going to go into 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I don't know how much you know about the history of Israel, but... But Israel had this ongoing enemy, the Philistines. Really, for hundreds of years, the Philistines had been attacking the Israelites. And if you know anything about the Holy Land, uh, the Mediterranean Sea area, the, the Philistines lived along the Mediterranean Sea, and they came up a hill, and they were, they were looking to attack the Israelites once again. And so you have the Philistines on one hillside, and the Israelites on the other, and neither one wanted to go down into the valley because they knew whoever goes down into the valley would be at a disadvantage. You always want to be on the higher ground when you're facing an enemy. That's a good principle for life, isn't it? You always want to take the higher ground. So they were in this kind of stalemate. stalemate. They were in this kind of gridlock until the giant, Goliath, comes out. And he says... You bring someone out, out to fight me, and we'll fight one-on-one. -on -one. And whoever wins that battle will be the winner of the war. If, if I win, you will be our slaves. If you win, we will be your slaves. And this was a, really an ancient practice of how to overcome these kind of gridlocks. Uh, many civilizations practiced this type of warfare where you would assign just one-on-one so, uh, -on -one fighting to tell who would win the battle. 
The only problem was, as you might know, Goliath was nine feet tall. He was covered in armor. And he was a trained fighter. Who wants to go up against him? I mean, he's really, I don't know if someone, you even know this reference, he was the Shaquille O'Neal of warriors. You guys remember who that was? But uh, he really could, could go up against anybody. And so he was calling the Israelites out and and you would expect, who would be the person to go forward and fight against Goliath one-on-one? Really, the obvious choice would be King Saul. If you know anything about Israel's history, the first king in Israel, he stood a head taller than everybody else, and he was a great warrior. He was the person you would expect to come out and fight against Goliath, but this is what we read in verse 11. Oops. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 11. On hearing the Philistines' words... Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Instead of being courageous and fighting for his people, Saul the king was dismayed and terrified, and the way the leader goes, so goes the people. Saul and then all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. But I get this, don't you? Don't you get this idea of being afraid? I mean, we're all afraid of something. I'll give you an example from my own life. It might be silly to you, but it's real to me. From, I think I've even mentioned this before. From about, I don't know, when I was in about first grade, I was terrified to read or speak in public. Whenever I was called on by a teacher, since the first grade, I would, I would have these kind of panic attacks or where my heart would start beating, I would get all sweaty, my, my vision would kind of go tunnel vision, the words seemed to jump all over the pages, and I was terrified. And this went all the way through grade school. I remember into high school, I was given just a passage to, to read on a Christmas service, and I practiced weeks and weeks to read this short little passage, and guess what I did? When I got to that moment, I biffed it, right? I totally messed it up in fear. And this went on not just through high school, but I thought, you know, I re- for as long as I can remember, I, I thought I really would like to be a pastor. I feel like God's calling me into the ministry. This is the thing I want to do. But my fears kept me from wanting to, to fulfill that calling. In fact, through the four years of college, I dealt with this fear. All through four years of seminary, even my internship year, I remember my first sermon as a, as a vicar, that we call it, I was just so afraid that, that again, I was making all of these mistakes I was reading, making all of these mistakes as I was speaking, and my bishop, the, the, my pastor over me, you know, he wrote an evaluation. He said, it was everything all right? You, you seemed very nervous. You didn't seem to know what you were doing up there. And, and I just had this overwhelming fear. So I get this. I was afraid of what people thought of me. I was afraid of people. I was afraid of failure. And this fear was just paralyzing. Now, that's my fear, and it was very real to me. It might seem silly to you, but, but you have your own fear. Maybe it's a fear to deal with an addiction. You're afraid to open up that Pandora's box, that if you actually deal with the thing you're struggling with, there's this fear that you might fail. Maybe you have a fear of, of a relationship, giving yourself and devoting yourself to another person. Maybe you have a fear of conflict. There's a conflict in your family or a conflict with a friend and and instead of actually dealing with that conflict, you just keep pushing it down the road, kicking the can down the road because you're so afraid. Maybe you have a fear of of, of what people might think of you if you, you try something new. You have a fear of people. Whatever it is, I think we understand this whole idea of giants in our lives and fear and how debilitating that can be. Well, luckily, there was one man who was not afraid. We hear about another man. His his name is David. He's a young boy. And David was the eighth child in this family of Jesse. He had seven older brothers. And his three oldest brothers were, his three oldest brothers, they were already in Saul's army. And they're already at the front battle lines. And so Jesse told David, who was a shepherd boy, he said, David, go bring some supplies and food and cheese and provisions to your brothers and see how they're doing. So that's what David did. He left his sheep, took these supplies and provisions and left it with the the, the keeper of the supplies. David lived in Bethlehem about 10 miles away from where the battle was taking place. He walked those 10 miles and 
He dropped off the supplies, went to the front lines to talk with his brothers and see how they were doing. And while he was talking with them, big bad Goliath came out and said his usual acts of defiance. He started cursing the God of Israel and taunting the Israelites and and calling someone out to fight him. And David got angry. He thought, who's going to go fight this man? No one should be able to talk like this uh, against the God of Israel. No one should be able to talk like this against the God of our army. And when David started talking like this, his oldest brother, Eliab, said this. Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Do you see what Eliab, the oldest son in the family, is saying? I get this. I'm an oldest child. I understand what was going on here. He's saying, David, you don't belong down here. You're a little shepherd boy. Go take care of your little sheep. Go back home. In fact, you're conceited and, and your, your heart is wicked. You didn't come to bring us supplies. You don't care about us. You just came to see how the battle was going. Do you get what Eliab's doing? I get this. Eliab is envious because his little boy brother is courageous. He knows that, that as the oldest son in the family, he should be the one ready to go out and fight that battle. He should be the one to go out and face the giant. But fear is driving him. And so when he sees little David conquering his fears and, and stepping up, he wants to knock him down. And I get that. Right? When we see other people successful, when we see other people overcoming the things that we're afraid of, Very often we get envious and we start making excuses and we start trying to ridicule them or knock them down or explain why why their situation is different. Instead of repenting and dealing with our own situation, we want to knock other people down so that everyone can be miserable together, right? And so that's what Eliab is doing. He's, I I get this, he's envious and he's envious that, that David is overcoming his weakness, and overcoming his fear when Eliab can't. But luckily, David didn't listen. David didn't listen and, and he kept on talking like this until he was brought into Saul's presence. And King Saul said, you can't go up against Goliath. You're a little boy. And David, uh, I mean, Goliath, he's a trained fighter from his whole life. But David said, I can do this. God will be with me. I'll win the battle. And so Saul said, okay, well, at least put on my armor. And now this is kind of a humorous part of the Bible. Can you imagine a little boy, you know, we don't know exactly how old David is, but a little boy putting on a great big tall king's armor. He's kind of swimming in it, right? He came and move around because it's so big. Now, many people believe that the reason Saul wanted David to wear his armor was to somehow take credit for Saul or for David's bravery. But David wouldn't fall for that. He took off the armor. He knew who he was. He knew who he was called to to be. He knew what God had gifted him in. And he went down to the river, grabbed five smooth stones, and he walked up to Goliath. Now, Goliath sees this little boy coming out towards him, and he starts to laugh at him. And he's even insulted that this is the best that they can do is bring out this boy against him. He says, what am I, a dog, that you would come at me with sticks? But again, David is not intimidated. And this is what David says. It's a little longer reading. I'm going to read a few verses here. 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse 45. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Again, only the Bible talks like this. Um, This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. I want to focus on that last verse I read. 
all those gathered here will know that it's not, it's not by sword, spear, it's not by our own technology, it's not by our own strength that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. David knew the theme of the scriptures. He knew his Bible. David could think back to Israel's story, how when, when the Egyptians were chasing after the Israelites as they came out of slavery. God swallowed up the Egyptian army in the Red Sea because it's the Lord who saves. As hundreds of thousands of Israelites were led into the wilderness without food or water, the Lord provided for them in the wilderness because it's the Lord who saves. After Joshua brought them into the promised land, they fought against Jericho and the walls came tumbling down without, without them fighting because it's the Lord who saves. Or, or the story of Gideon during the time of the judges when a few hundred Israelites fought against the great army of the Midianites without sword or spear, but only uh, jars and lanterns because it's the Lord who saves. And even in David's own life, he had been attacked by a lion, attacking his sheep, and he'd been attacked by a bear. And David killed a lion and a bear with his sling because it's the Lord who saves. And so the same is true. If we're going to face our giants, uh, if we, can, we want to begin to slay our giants, how can we begin to slay our giants? First of all, remember it's the Lord who saves. The giants that we face are bigger than us and we cannot overcome them. It's the Lord who saves. And so we need to re remember our past, remember the history of Israel. We can remember the stories of Moses and the Egyptians and we can remember the story of, of, of Joshua and Jericho and, and Midian and the Gideonites but, and David and Goliath, but the story we really want to remember is David's greater son, Jesus. See, the one giant that all of us are going to face regardless of who you are, is death. All of us are going to die. And that's a giant too big for us to handle. There's no amount of preparation, no amount of, of, of training that will lead us to overcome death. It's an inevitable giant that we're going to have to face. But here's the good news. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ walked up to the giant death on the cross and faced our sin, and paid for all of our sin, and won the victory, and proved that he won the victory by being raised from the dead. Because it's the Lord who saves. And anytime we see any kind of victory in our life, anytime we face any kind of giant, the only way we're ultimately going to win the victory is if we remember it's the Lord who saves. Now the next step is even more, or just as important. You see, David didn't just have an intellectual faith where he believed facts in his head. He, he let his faith fuel his action. And this is what I find so remarkable about this story. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down to the ground. When, the, when Goliath was going closer to David, David didn't run away. David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. When David had an enemy coming at him, he didn't turn around and run the other way. He ran toward his enemy. And that's what we need to do also. See, how can we begin to slay our giants? Well, we first need to remember it's the Lord who saves and because it's the Lord who saves, you can face your fear. You can face your fear. You know, clinical psychologists are just catching up on this. Uh, they, they say if you really want to overcome your fear of something, you can't overcome your fear by running away from it. If you run away from what you're afraid of, the giant just gets bigger. The fears just multiply. In fact, you, you end up locking yourself in your own self-made prison of fear. And so because it's the Lord who saves, it's not us, because we rely on the Lord, it's time to begin to take a step towards what we're afraid of. It's time to begin to face your fear. I knew that's what I had to do when I was afraid to speak in front of people. I mean, again, that might be a silly example, but, 
But think about that. I, I, I finally came to the point, I said, you know what? I don't care what people think about me. It's the Lord who saves. I don't care how many times I fail. It's the Lord who saves. My identity is in Jesus Christ. Sure, I'm going to fail and I'm going to say some things wrong and I'm going to get mixed up, but I want to be a pastor. I believe God has called me to do this and I'm going to face it. And I began to face, stand in front of people, facing the thing I fear over and over again until now, I'm not afraid anymore. Now, that doesn't mean that my fears are gone. Just new giants have popped up, new things that I'm terrified about. And now I want to ask you, <laughs> what are your giants? Everyone has them. What are the things that you're afraid of? Is it, again, facing that addiction? If it is, take a step towards it to face it because it's the Lord who saves. Maybe it's a relationship that you haven't been devoted to. Take a step towards that relationship. Maybe it's a conflict in your family or at work or in your life. Take a step towards towards it. Maybe it's a fear of, of, of people, of people's opinions. Take a step towards it because it's the Lord who saves. And this is not a one-time deal. I said, how do we begin to slay our giants? This might be a lifelong process for us. It might be two steps forward, three steps back, but, but because it's the Lord who saves, we can begin to take a step towards our giants. I wish David would remember that. I wish he would have kept facing his giants. You know what? It's actually a good thing that we have giants in our life. Jesus said it this way. Uh, if you want to be a disciple, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Pick up the cross and, and face the giant in front of you. It's a good thing that we have giants in our life because that uh, leads us to, to face something that's bigger than us and leads us to trust in the Lord. But David forgot that. He forgot it's the Lord who slaves, so later on in his life, he called for a census of all of the armies that he had to, to pridefully glory in how big his army was because he forgot it was the Lord who saves. He stopped facing his giants because um, when he was supposed to be out in war and, and fighting for his people, he stayed back in his palace. And that's when he looked upon a, a woman bathing called Bathsheba. Instead of facing the giant of lust, he gave in and, and committed adultery and then actually committed murder to cover up his, his sin. And so it's a good thing that you have giants, but you need to face those giants. It's a good thing to, to every day deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow Jesus. Because when you have a giant in front of you, that leads you to trust in the Lord who overcomes your giants and it gives meaning and purpose to our mundane lives. And so, how can you begin to slay your giants? Remember, it's ultimately the Lord Jesus who saves us. So now you can face your fear. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue now confessing this ancient creed that it's not human beings who say, but the Lord Jesus. And this creed really focuses on Jesus is not just a human being. Jesus is our true God. Let's speak those words.